No, anyway, it's a pleasure to be at Autonoma. It's a wonderful place. Um, don't spend enough time of my enough of a fraction of my life in Barcelona. That's sort of the moral of the story, I think. Um, so this is stuff that lots of people have, have sort of vaguely been worried about, and I want to write some kind of piece on thinking about sort of non-cooperative equilibrium in a tax game. And much to my frustration, I didn't find much of a benchmark um, with which to compare it. It's the scattered stuff all in the literature. So most of the results that you're going to see are going to be kind of familiar results. The main contribution here is to put it all together in one integrated place. So it's useful for teaching graduate students, I think. And I hope you'll learn something about this. So this is a joint work with Juan Pa and Pedro Teles. Um, and so let me get right on to it. So I'm going to think about Ramsey taxation in a global economy. So it's going to be an economy with a bunch of countries. For simplicity, in this exposition, I'm going to think about just two countries. But nothing important relies on that. Uh, and I'm going to ask standard kinds of questions. Should capital income be taxed? Is free trade optimal? Should income be taxed at source or by residence? These are kinds of familiar questions when it comes to taxing international income. Uh, for example, whoops. For example, the last one, there are a bunch of recent proposals. The US is uni almost unique among all developed economies in taxing worldwide income. Most other developed economies, how do I do this? I'm doing something wrong. I think, ah, oh, here. No. I knocked it off. Here is OK. Ah, yes. So most of the rest of the developed world taxes only income that's earned in that particular territory. The U.S. tries to extract rents from the rest of the world. Yeah, you know, it got, get, it's got to get paid for the fact that it spends a larger fraction of GDP uh, uh, allegedly defending the rest of the world. So it attracts a lot of things. And then there's a question about whether that's part of an overall cooperative equilibrium or not. So a bunch of questions like that, which are very uh, very prevalent in popular discussions and debates, and so I want, wanted the framework to help me think these issues through seriously. So, what are we going to do? Um, we're going to assume what, I, what we call a rich tax system. What do I mean by a rich tax system? That means that I'm going to consider tax instruments that are commonly used by essentially all developed economies. I'm not going to restrict myself to a small tax system. I am going to focus on Ramsey equilibria. So in a Ramsey equilibrium environment, you take the set of tax instruments as given, you try and design the system optimally. The alternative, which is Merleysian, and I'll talk a little bit about that, is to derive uh, the tax system endogenously from informational and other frictions. The important thing about the, the uh, Ramsey approach is that it invariably yields what, what I've called wedges rather than taxes. Uh, there are typically multiple ways of implementing a desirable uh, Ramsey allocation. And so to say things like um, Ramsey stuff tells you that this tax should be zero or that tax should be zero is almost invariably incorrect. Um, the more precise statement is it says this wedge should be zero or that wedge should be positive. But it's convenient in normal conversation to translate that wedge into popular implementations. What I mean by that is one that, that seeks you to find, to, that seeks you to, to put you on the Pareto frontier of countries. chooses all the instruments to maximize some weighted average of utilities of households in the individual countries. 
throughout, we'll need to take some stand on initial policies or promises. Uh, and I'm going to assume that the value of wealth cannot be, initial wealth, cannot be below some benchmark level. Uh, that's the approach I'm going to take, and then I'll talk about why I think that approach might make sense. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about a whole bunch of different models, so I might as well uh, start with by answering the three questions I started off with. The first question was, should capital income be taxed? And so I've already told you there are multiple implementations. So that's not quite the right question. So the right question is, are intertemporal wedges optimal or not? So that's, instead of using this complicated jargon-filled language that only we can understand, I'll translate this language throughout to saying capital income should not be taxed, but really you should think about this as saying there should be no intertemporal distortions. Okay? So whenever I say capital income should not be taxed, what I really mean is that there should be no intertemporal distortions. Um, so the answer is going to be that it should not be taxed in the steady state in general, and it could be taxed or subsidized along the transition. And with standard kinds of macro preferences, isoelastic in consumption and in labor, you get that that you never want to distort capital accumulation uh, ever. All right? You don't want, want to tax capital income at all. Is free trade optimal? In the framework I'm considering, which is a cooperative Ramsey equilibrium, namely I'm trying to, to find points on the Pareto frontier, uh, the answer is free trade is indeed optimal if I'm allowed to make government to government transfers in my complete markets environment, that's, it's enough to make these transfers in period zero. So you can think about this as relabeling initial claims. And if those initial claims happen to be just right with respect to the welfare weights, then you may not need those transfers. In general, for any arbitrary set of weights, if government to government transfers are not allowed, then free trade may not be optimal. The answer to the last question, source versus residence-based taxation, in general, residence-based taxation is a lot better. There are complicated ways of having source-based taxation with appropriate other tariffs and tax on this and tax on that and everything else, which get you the same answer. But uh, I think the simpler answer to say is that residence-based taxation always works. And then a secondary comment to this is, this is something the literature has talked a lot about, is that to the extent that you want to have value-added taxes, it makes sense, like most European countries, and I think Japan also have uh, value-added taxes with border adjustment. What that means basically is that you tax only domestic value-added. You do not uh, uh, include export revenues in sales, and you do not allow a deduction for imports. So these statements, do they depend on the availability of government to government transfers? Uh, do these statements, um, in, general, in general, all of these statements do depend on the government-to-government -government transfers. These are less important, all right, okay. These, I think, will still hold up uh, without that. Um, I haven't worked out all the details because the argument here is slightly different. Um, but, um, but certainly, the, free tr the optimality of free trade depends cr critically on your ability to make lump sum transfers across uh, governments. Okay, I'm gonna make a bunch of other points. Um, there's a literature uh, on capital taxation that many of you are familiar with, which leads to a presumption of high capital taxation, at least initially. I'm gonna argue that that literature uh, is not particularly helpful in designing actual policies and actual economies because they consider a restricted tax system, not only do they consider a restricted tax system, they consider an unrealistically restricted tax system, and they get all their effects through valuation effects. I, I don't know how much of this stuff I'll get to, in that I hate talking about other people's papers. I'd rather talk about mine, uh, but I'll talk a little bit about this. So when it's a trade, is it only goods, or the capital, or people, or? So I'll, I'll, I'm going to describe a particular model of trade, so I'm going to take a benchmark international trade model that's widely used in the applied literature. 
International, that's the model due to Bacchus Kehoe Kidland. Pretty much all of my insights that I'm going to talk about hold true in models like Stockman and Tsar with traded and non-traded goods, Eaton Quartum, and you'll see why in a, in a variety of different ways. The details of the production structure turn out not to matter for the essential results. Okay, but this is a, 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 a standard workhorse model that's used in a huge fraction of international macro, and so it seems like the sensible model to start with. And it's clearer to start with this model rather than some general abstract model that nobody will, able to, will be able to understand. Okay, so what's the basic structure of, that, of their model? Um, there are a bunch of countries, so I here, superscript I, is going to denote the country. I'm going to have two countries. Again, as I said, for simplicity, uh, there's a representative household in each one of these countries, has neoclassical preferences, and the key innovation that they came up with was that, um, that the stuff that's traded is um, intermediate goods, are the only things that are traded, right? So think about this. There are two types of um, intermediate goods. I'm going to call them I. That might be confusing. Maybe I should call the J, but whatever. Um, apples and bananas, right? And each country has an ability to produce. So country I produces apples. Country, country one, say, produces apples. Country two produces bananas. This is the amount of apples used in production in country one, and that's the amount of uh, apples used in production by country two, right? So each country produces a particular type of intermediate good. They export some of it. They import the other type of intermediate good. Then they combine these intermediate goods in order to produce a composite consumption investment good that can be used either for private consumption, government consumption, or for investment, all right? What's the nice thing about this formulation? It's consistent with a variety of features of the international data, namely that imports, even for countries that are very reliant on world trade, typically account for less than 50% of, of their total product. So it's consistent with all the Armington aggregator types of, uh, of formulations. Um, so it gets you that automatically, or not automatically, it gets you that with, by specifying this function g appropriately. And then, as I mentioned yesterday, has nice features like because they introduce investment, they're able to get pro-cyclical current account and trade deficits and things like that. Uh, so there are lots of things to like about this basic formulation. I'm going to, I just should say that I'm going to talk throughout about a deterministic model. Every single thing I say holds true in a stochastic model with complete markets. So this is only for expositional purposes. Okay, so this is what I mean by ri rich tax system to start with. Well, I'm going to make it even richer, but this is going to be a particular tax system. I'm going to have taxes on consumption goods, taxes on labor, taxes on initial wealth, and as I mentioned earlier, there are in period zero, we can make transfers to the uh, two governments, but of course there's the budget balance constraint that says that the transfers have got to sum up to zero, all right? And that can be interpreted as labeling initial claims. So that's the basic structure of the, of the tax system, except for this tax on initial wealth. These are essentially saying that the only things that I can tax are goods consumed by households. And notice that those goods can, the consumption, tax on consumption goods, can be different across the two countries. They're not required to be the same. I'm sorry? These transfers. I think legitimate question to ask is what happens without the transfers? Somebody else or no, this is, it's, it's because of the standard kind of problem. Think about solving a Pareto problem. This is the second welfare theorem. And trying to implement the uh, a Pareto optimal allocation you need transfers if, if you want to implement the Pareto optimal allocation as a competitive equilibrium. So that's what these transfers are doing. But not a competitive equilibrium with these taxes. So that they're playing with And appropriately these defined. Taxes seriously, then the taxes should also be used for the distribution. 
Oh, absolutely. These are going to be used for distribution also, potentially. There's nothing that prevents it. There's nothing I'm, I'm telling you that says these taxes are not going to be used for distribution. Yeah. Probably won't because they will be very inefficient. You would want to use the lump sum for distribution. Sure. No, no, that's right. So I think a legitimate question to ask is, a good question to ask is, what happens if you throw this away? It's a worthwhile question, but in the standard kind of second welfare theorem type of analysis, we start by, by putting this in, allowing for these, then we throw them away, and I'll talk briefly about what happens when you throw them away. Okay. Um, so what do the wedges end up looking like in a compatible equilibrium? All right, these are standard kinds of first order conditions. You get something that looks like a labor wedge. Does this, how does this work? Ah. Is this, whoops. Uh, you get a labor wedge, which affects the, uh, uh, the ratios, the marginal rates of substitution, or marginal products of labor, which because of my two-sector model has both the intermediate goods and the final goods production, and produces what, I, what I've called an investment wedge, or an alternatively an inter intertemporal wedge, which affects the intertemporal marginal rates of substitution. There are two other properties of any compatible equilibrium. Uh, so I'm just going through this quick. I'm saving you from all the algebra which, where you derive this. One which I'll call dynamic production efficiency. This is essentially um, firms have an incentive to uh, sh ship, say, apples from here to there in exchange for uh, bananas tomorrow to be used for uh, in order to reduce the amount of apples in the future. Uh, it's that kind of condition which ge ge generates that intertemporal condition and a static production efficiency condition that essentially says that the marginal rate of, of transformation in production for any given good across the two countries must be, uh, must be the same. Charlie? Yes? No tariffs? I'm sorry? Not I did not have tariffs as part of my instruments to start with, all right, and so I'm characterizing this competitive equilibrium, and then we'll talk about the optimality of tariffs, okay? <clears throat> all right. So, this is a stand kind of theorem, so what I'm going to do is to characterize what, what, what we've called the implementable set, the set of allocations that can be supported as, um, as a competitive equilibrium. And this is essentially the implementability constraint, which you get from the household's budget constraint or the government's budget constraint by substituting in the appropriate first order conditions. That's the thing that I'm going to call the value of initial wealth adjusted for taxes. And then these dynamic production efficiency allocations. So what does the theorem say? And this is an important theorem. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward to prove, but you've got to be careful to prove it. And it's a, it provides necessary and sufficient conditions for uh, some set of allocations to be implementable as a, com as a competitive equilibrium with the set of taxes that I've given you. All right? And the answer is that the allocation and period zero policies are implementable if and only if they satisfy the implementability condition, the resource constraints, and the production efficiency conditions. All right, okay? So if they satisfy all three of these conditions, then I can implement it as a competitive equilibrium with an appropriate tax system. And if they, sat, and if they are part of a competitive equilibrium with those, uh, then you can satisfy it. This comes back to something that Albert was concerned about. There's one more condition which is that the present value of the current account deficit of a country must be equal to its initial wealth. Right? Why doesn't that constraint show up as an additional constraint here? The answer is because I can use those initial transfers, our initial label, relabeling of initial wealth, to always ensure that this condition is satisfied. Right? If I did not have that ability, then I would have one more condition that would need to be satisfied in this, um, in this proposition, right? Okay? What does this theorem imply? 
so now let me go on to the cooperative Ramsey equilibrium. As I suggested earlier, I'm just going to think about a cooperative planner who's choosing all these instruments for both of these countries to maximize a weighted average of utilities over the implementable set. Why is it okay for me to do it only over the implementable set? Because Proposition 1 told me that that was a complete characterization of the competitive equilibrium. Right? Okay? So that's all I need to look at. Um, I am going to impose a restriction on initial wealth. I'm going to say that your initial wealth, this is essentially a, a res joint restriction on this tax policy L together with all of these allocations, cannot sh fall short of some initial wealth. So what I have in mind is that people made investment decisions in the previous period, so to speak, before I started this Ramsey planner, anticipating certain returns. And anticipating their wealth in marginal utility terms and price terms would be equal to something. I'm going to respect that and say, you can't screw with that. You can't screw with promises in terms of wealth weighted in, in, in marginal utility terms. You can alter the prices, and, but, but if you do so, you must alter the taxes and things like that in such a way as to offset these effects completely. Just pure clarification. This is the, the, the initial wealth before or after the transfers. So the, the transfers... This is the initial wealth of the household. Yeah. The transfers are made between governments, and so therefore that's something that's going to affect the government's budget constraint, so to speak, but does not directly affect the, uh, the household's wealth constraint. Yeah. So does that imply that in, in the absence of lump sum taxes, the implementability condition is going to bind or not? Uh, obviously, it depends on how big W bar i is mm -hmm. or how small it is. If W bar i is sufficiently large, then the implementability constraint is going to bind. All right, okay. But this particular restriction is not guaranteeing that per se. No, I mean, if I set W bar i, to be minus infinity, then the implementability constraint would not bind. All right? That's all. So uh, whether the implementability constraint is going to bind or not depends on how severe that restriction is. Um, our theorems cover both the cases where this constraint is binding and where this constraint is not binding. But let me focus on the interesting case where I'm going to assume that this constraint is binding. If this constraint is binding, then the implementability constraint will be binding. So, the first theorem, which is almost immediate from this characterization, is that the Ramsey allocation must satisfy production efficiency. The dynamic conditions for production efficiency and the static conditions. What's the proof? Proof is pretty straightforward. Originally, I told you the Ramsey problem was maximize that over the implementable set. Now consider what I'll call a relaxed Ramsey problem where I drop these production efficiency conditions. I keep the resource constraints. All right? So I'm just going to solve it over the, over the implementability condition and the resource constraints. That's it. All right? Immediately, anything that solves that problem the reason is that these intermediate goods and everything else don't show up in the implementability constraint. Immediately implies that anything that solves that resource constraint the, over the technology set is going to also be production efficient. It's also going to satisfy the conditions for production efficiency and for a static and dynamic uh, production efficiency. So therefore, the relaxed Ramsey problem satisfies those additional conditions so it must coincide with the original Ramsey problem. And so what that tells you is that the Ramsey allocation satisfies production efficiency. This now goes back in part to address Menke's question. Um, suppose I added tariffs as an instrument to this problem. Would I want to use tariffs? No. All right? So optimality of free trade follows immediately. Going back to what Albert was concerned about, what if I did not have these transfers? The problem now is that all kinds of prices and amounts of intermediate goods and things like that 
sh start showing up in this constraint. And so now, free trade is no longer optimal. The simplest way of thinking about this is, forget about government spending, forget about why I'm financing all of this stuff, anything else. I've got two types of agents. I really like one guy. I don't care about the other guy. I can't tax him directly. What am I going to do? I'm going to alter relative prices so as to favor the person I really like who has a rich, uh, high, uh, to, uh, raise the relative price of the good that uh, this guy is really highly endowed with so as to make him better off. Okay? So that's a sense in which tariffs are in fact, or distorting relative prices is optimal when you don't have uh, government to government transfers allowed. All right, okay, so that's the, the, that's the standard kind of result that, by the way, the people don't remark on, but you should know it from, from general equilibrium theory that the second welfare theorem does depend critically on your ability to make transfers across people. If you don't have that ability, then you want to implement, you want to support something. You do want to screw up relative prices. It's not like you don't want to. So I'm not saying anything dramatically new. I'm just reminding you of something that you should have known already that you, you may want to distort relative prices if you can't make direct transfers. Only if you can make direct transfers that you don't want to dis distort relative prices. So, so tariffs? Forget about tariffs. Don't get complicated with tariffs. Just think that, no, 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 no. In order for you to understand the result, in order for you to understand the result, all right, okay, think that there are only two of you, you and Nobu, all right? I really like you. What would I want to do? You're endowed with apples, he's endowed with bananas. I want to make you really well off. The instrument I have available is that every time Nobu ships a banana to you, I can impose a tariff or alternatively a subsidy or a tariff whenever you export apples to him. What would I want to do? Exactly. With standard kinds of preferences, I'm going to alter relative prices to benefit you, to hurt him, and... It hurts both of us probably, but more. No, it makes you better off than the status quo, than having no tariffs, it makes him worse off. Now what the second welfare theorem is, says is that, that if I could make lump sum transfers between the two of you, there's an alternative way of making those transfers so as to make you just as well off as you used to be with the tariffs and make him strictly better off. That's what the second welfare theorem is asserting. And, and all I'm saying is if I don't have these transfers, if I can't relabel it, then um, then it's going to be inefficient. There's a separate theorem, which is also true, which I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on, which is you can ask the following question, which is not quite the question I'm asking. You can ask, is any allocation that is on the Pareto frontier, maybe I should have, but that's fine. Is any allocation that is production efficient? All right, okay, this is the first welfare theorem like uh, uh, question and satisfies the implementability constraint, right? Okay, is that allocation on the Pareto frontier, right? And the answer is not every allocation like that is on the Pareto frontier, but certainly any allocation. Uh, anyway, so, so that that's just, that. Uh, let me not talk too much about the first welfare theorem. We'll talk about it later. Okay, let me now turn to. Um, the second issue, which I was, uh, it's actually the first thing, about intertemporal distortions, about capital income taxes. This is complicated and ugly, uh, and I apologize for the complicated ugly. I don't have to apologize. <laughs> We're all grown up uh, people who are, who are used to writing down these equations like this, even if we don't like to display them in public, um, but you have to. Uh, no, you have to work them out, you don't have to display them in public. This just tells you the Ramsey allocation. What does it look like um, um, in general? And the answer is that it's a complicated mess. So that's 
That's the marginal rate of substitution. That's the marginal rate of transformation. This object over here is roughly 1 over the labor wedge. And this is 1 over the intertemporal wedge. That, or this, yeah, 1 over the intertemporal wedge. That's what that object is. Those things depend on, um, on, uh, on elasticities of, intertemporal elasticities of substitution in consumption, upon cross elasticities be between consumption and leisure, or consumption and labor, and how they vary across time. It's some ugly mess, all right? And what you can show through a whole bunch of numerical examples, which I won't bore you throughout, is that there's no presumption that these have to have one sign or another. Depending on the details of what the transition looked like, they can be positive, they can be negative. All right, okay? So it could be, um, it could involve subsidizing capital accumulation, could involve uh, taxing capital accumulation, it can take all kinds of shapes. So there's no presumption that you want to uh, induce intertemporal distortions in a particular direction. <clears throat> but if you look at this stuff, you can see that in a steady state, all of these things are equal to each other. So you immediately get the classic result that one of, one of the three main results in public finance which is that you don't get any intertemporal distortions in the steady state, regardless of what your ut utility function happens to look like within the period. Uh, a different result, which I think is much more relevant for applied work in this area, is if you consider what I call standard macro preferences, this constant elasticity in, uh, of marginal utility, and uh, constant fresh elasticity, kinds of preferences. You guys have seen a thousand papers even at this conference with preferences of this form. So that's why I call them standard macro preferences. Everybody uses them. Then these things are all constant over time. They cancel out. So Alright, I'm sorry, they, these cancel out. The second, the second one cancels out. I'm sorry? Okay, so the short answer to that is, as I'll see later on, Straub and Berling consider what I call an unrealistically restricted tax system. That is, they, they allow taxation only of capital income and labor, and they limit the tax rate on capital income to less than one, which is a perfectly reasonable assumption. But they don't allow for consumption taxes, they don't allow for dividend taxes, they don't allow for a variety of other taxes, all of which are used commonly in practice. Where I'm departing, where I'm departing from, from, I think that the, I, I, you'll get me on this diatribe. That whole Chandley Judd literature, if people had only paid attention to Lucas Stokey, Diamond Murleys, and Ramsey, nobody would have gotten into this mess. <laughs> nobody. <laughs> because those guys considered what I'd call realistic tax systems, where what can you tax? Consumption. Can you tax consumption? Yeah, I see countries doing it all the time. Can you tax dividends? Yeah, I see them doing that all the time. Can I tax labor income? Yeah, I see them doing it all the time. Can I tax corporate profits? Yeah. So, in practice, countries have a rich array of taxes. Now, if you restrict yourself to a small playground in one tiny corner of this big soccer field, and you say, oh, look, I got weird results. Say, yeah, come on, get up and play with the big boys, <laughs> right, over, over here. And once you play with the big boys, you'll see it's because you were playing with the five-year-olds. All right. Big boys have negative consumption taxes, right? No, they didn't. This doesn't tell you that ta tax on consumption. The optimal, don't you need negative consumption? No, 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 no. In general, as you'll see in a minute, okay. uh, a constant consumption tax, at least with standard macro preferences. Negative. No, constant. Constant positive. You still have got to satisfy the government's budget constraint. And by the way, I'm assuming, I should have said this all along, I'm assuming that G is non-negative, right? You don't get stuff from, for free from the government. 
you got to pay for it, okay? All right, so as long as G is positive, then you got to have a positive consumption tax. Uh, and in particular, so this is the point here, that given that, that all this is true, there are no intertemporal distortions, you can get a consumption tax. Why does that have to be positive? If G is positive, initial debt is zero, just to keep life simple, all right? Then you need a positive consumption tax in order to raise the revenues to pay for the G. So that's immediate. This is a kind of generic thing, also. Like, uh, you don't want to tax the intermediate uh, I, will, I will get back to the general intuition, I hope, yeah. by the end of this talk, yeah. which tries to put all this into the language of production efficiency. Yeah. That's why, remember I was saying earlier that whatever I'm going to talk about applies in Eton Cortum, yeah. applies in Stockman Tsar applies in pretty much any international trade model you want to write down, yeah. all, those statements are all come from the statement that in general you want production efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. All right, okay? So, and production efficiency means that one way of implementing efficient allocations is not to tax intermediate goods. Mm -hmm. that's, that's at the bottom of everything and it's actually as you'll turn out, as, as will turn out, with these preferences, it's like a two-line proof. It's kind of cool two-line proof, which you may be one of the few people to appreciate. Uh, Sorry? Yes, sir. What about like, so this statement about the intertemporal distortions, what about like, these, like period zero, period one? Are you claiming that for those as well? I am saying ever. With my constraint on initial wealth promises, all right, okay, rather than a constraint on initial policies, this, is true from period zero on. <clears throat> so you can implement it with a constant consumption tax. Okay, so let me talk about alternative implementations. So now let me expand the tax base. Let me suppose that I can tax capital income of households, I can tax asset income of households, and I can tax labor income to make it interesting. I'm gonna drop uh, co consumption taxes for a minute, but you'll see what it does. Um, so now I want to think about the intermediate goods firm as maximizing the present discounted value of dividends. Q is the, um, uh, is the price of a numeraire in period T in terms of period zero. And dividends, where do you get dividends from? You get it from producing the consumption good, paying for labor, um, paying for the investment good, and then potentially uh, paying a tax on the income, net of depreciation uh, on the final good. The flow of funds constraint for the household, this is one part that's kind of interesting, is I'm going to allow the household to hold both domestic assets and foreign assets. Um, sort of an interesting thing which I learned along the way, which I don't think is widely understood, that what I'm going to do is tax the uh, household. This is essentially the value of its equity holdings, the amount of the equities that it's holding in these firms. Um, and the tax is calculated on dividends plus a capital gains adjusted for exchange rate movements, okay, all right? So once you do this adjustment, and the same sort of thing for the tax on foreign assets, whatever return you get on foreign assets, net of what are effectively exchange rate movements, if you do this, so the income is defined, <coughs> net evaluation changes, what you end up with is the same old theorem, you still get static production efficiency and dynamic production efficiency, all right? Okay? In order to get you to efficiency, you must set either these tax rates on capital income equal to zero, or you must set this in this complicated kind of way, and you set the labor income tax to do the job that the consumption tax used to do in order to take care of the static distortion. And with standard macro preferences, you set these taxes equal to zero. So changing this set did not change any of the 
uh, implications of what, it, what, what you do. What if I consider a different set of taxes? So just to say there are lots of ways of implementing that particular Ramsey equilibrium. You can't do better than that. Unless, you, of course, you magically I gave you lump sum taxes. I'm not going to let you do that. Um, uh, but, but all of them have the same, same Ramsey outcome. Suppose now I have value added taxes and labor income taxes and value added taxes uh, in the sense that exports don't count as part of your revenues and you can't deduct imports. So it's tax only on domestic value added. Now I put hats on these only to say these prices don't have to be the same as the prices that we saw earlier. So the intermediate goods firm in this context, what are its revenues? It's, so think about country one, it's selling apples, either at home uh, or abroad, all right? Um, it's paying for its labor, it's paying for its investment, good. And then what's the tax that it's paying? It's only paying taxes on the amount of the intermediate goods that it sells at home and it's subtracting out from its investment of these, of these things. And the final goods firm similarly is going to be producing using apples and uh, bananas but it gets to subtract only the amount of apples that, that it buys. Okay, so this is the sense in which this is a value added tax with border adjustment. And the proposition in the paper, which is again pretty straightforward, is not surprisingly a VAT of this form is equivalent to a consumption tax, provided you set the VAT in this particular fashion. So for example, with standard macro preferences, you can implement the Ramsey outcome with a constant VAT with border adjustment. Can you do it with uh, a VAT without border adjustment? Yes, you can by introducing a complicated enough pattern of tariffs and things like that, but I think this is a simpler message just to say that this is one way of implementing it. So what the, what's, what, what, what's the bottom line, if you will? You can implement the Ramsey allocation, these environments. Let me restrict myself to standard macro preferences for a minute. The constant consumption tax, constant labor income tax, what we have shown in the paper, which I, I won't have time to talk about, is with a constant dividend tax, you can implement it with a constant VAT with border adjustment. So a variety of simple imp implementations which allow you to implement the Ramsey uh, equilibrium. Uh, you go to and all of those have free trade. Typical VAT is uh, including investment goods, no? Yeah, I agree. I, I I ex you subtract investment yeah. expenditures. Yeah. The right way of thinking about the VAT, actually a much simpler way of thinking about it uh, in a closed economy framework for simplicity yeah. is what's a VAT? You take your total revenues, you subtract out all payments to business enterprises, okay. including payments for investment okay. goods. That's the easiest way of thinking about it. <laughs> Once you... The European or other VAT, don't necessarily subtract investment expenses. Yes, they do. Yes, because what happens is that, that you get to subtract out all payments to other business enterprises oh, okay. for whatever goods you bought. They're not, class, they're not asking, mm -hmm. oh, you bought that car from the other firm or you bought toilet paper. Uh, you get to subtract. It's kind of, uh, the world actually, as always, is more complicated than what I'm going to say in practice because they have all kinds of slabs and all kinds of layers. Different goods get taxed at different rates. But for the vast majority of goods, the simplest way of describing this, the VAT system is whenever you write a check to a business enterprise, you get to, uh, what is it that called? That's a subtraction method, I think. The, the, the subtraction method. That's the simplest way of thinking about most VATs. You just get to subtract all business expenses, and that's what I'm doing here. So, question out of ignorance. So, the, this is because the goods that are being traded uh, are intermediate goods that look like investment goods. If there was a trade in final goods, would it be obvious that you also would want to have the border adjustment for a trade in final goods? It's, it's, not, it's not obvious. But it's true that you don't want to do it. The basic, 
slightly different logic, and I'll talk about that a little bit when I talk about source and resonance based. I won't answer your question directly, um, but, but I'll answer it indirectly. And the, and, and the simplest way of describing this is you want, you want potentially, I should have emphasized one thing throughout, there's no presumption here that the tax rates in the two countries have to be the same. Right? And so the question is, if I just think about a system with consumption taxes to fix simplicity, how do I want to tax? I want to tax all your final consumption at a constant rate, independently of where it produced. But I may want to tax people in the US and people in Europe at different rates. How do I do that? I tax your consumption, if you live in Europe, at a uniform rate, regardless of whether you bought those goods in Europe or the US and I tax American residents entirely on that. Now think about translating that into a VAT. Anybody who ships you a, a consumption good, what you should be doing is paying at your rate for that, uh, not, not their rate. That's the basic, that's the basic logic. The, the production function here, there's no value addition in the, in the, in the final goods stage, right? No, no, no uh, I, right, I, now, right now there is not. But I think Chris was, was, Chris was asking a more general question. How much do your results depend on trade only being intermediate goods, no trade in final goods? And, and the answer is the spirit of the general results continues to hold that you may want to tax final consumption at different rates. Uh, but the general principle about you want to tax based on residence rather than source which is what I'm going to turn to next. Well, I was going to, but anyway. Labor taxes are negative then. Sorry? Labor taxes are negative then. Why? To implement the first pass. Either what first? The labor wedge, the labor consumption wedge has to be zero. Why does the labor consumption wedge have to be zero? Well, you implement well, the first pass. No, no, you don't. No, no. no, you don't. There is a labor wedge. There is a labor wedge. In this economy. There is, I thought you said. No, 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 no. There's no intertemporal wedge. I misspoke. I'm sorry. If I, if I, if I thought, if you, th look, these two numbers are not the same. These are. I'm sorry. But could you reach, aren't you a first class from period one? No. No, 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 no. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I lost you early on. No, 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 no. You will typically want to keep, introduce a wedge between the marginal rate of substitution, consumption, and leisure, and the marginal rate of transformation of leisure into consumption. That you always, you will typically want a wedge on. I, my focus has been throughout on this intertemporal wedge. But this one. That one is always zero. This one is always zero. That one. If that one, the easiest way of thinking about what that wedge has got to be. Yeah. Okay. All right. Intratemporal distortions. I'm sorry, I can't get you to. Uh, I, I don't use that term, but I can't get you to uh, a lump sum tax equilibrium. I don't use whatever first best terms. Uh, so, uh, but that's a separate uh, discussion. Okay, uh, what we do do in the paper is talk about source versus residence-based taxations. It goes back to, to this, but I'm not going to be able to talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, let me talk about one aspect. This is related to stuff that Albert and Ramon have done. Uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, so I have this wealth restriction in utility terms. And it turns out that there's a sense in which that wealth restriction can be reinterpreted in an appropriate uh, way that the Ramsey equilibrium is indeed the, a Markov equilibrium of an appropriate game. I'm going to consider a closed economy for simplicity. So I'm not going to, it's not going to make, it's not a huge contribution, but I think it's a useful to the one necessarily. I'm going to consider a world with partial commitment. So think about the government in each period as handing over two sets of promises, 
One is a promise in terms of tax-adjusted marginal utility of consumption. The other is a tax-adjusted, consumption tax-adjusted um, uh, return promise, again, in marginal utility terms. Okay? So the government has partial commitment, can make this commitment only for one period, not for longer than that. And then the next period's government can do whatever it feels like doing, but must respect those promises that were made by, by the previous period's government. So ST, which is the state, consists of the capital stock, the level of government debt, the levels of these promises, marginal utility promises, and um, the government chooses the state for tomorrow, taking the state today as given, including in particular these promises. And what you get is a kind of neat theorem, which is that in this partial commitment game, the Ramsey equilibrium is a Markov equilibrium. I'm not saying it's, it's that the set of Markov equilibria coincides. There are other Markov equilibria which give you weird answers. And the proof is kind of a straightforward adaptation of stuff in Stokey Lucas Prescott and stuff that Ramon and Albert have done. So that's a sense in which there's a recursive sense in which if you could think that, that governments have this ability to make these uh, partial promises, then the Ramsey equilibrium does not require uh, an incredible amount of commitment. It requires only a fairly limited amount of commitment. Yes, yes, yes. But the commitment is only for one period at a time. Yeah, but I mean, imagine there's a situation where there are elections. And uh, this means, uh, this assumption means that, that the day before the election, I could commit for uh, whatever happens after the election. That's correct. Even if I'm not in power. That is correct. Okay. That's correct. In other words, uh, until recently, that's the way civilized countries used to behave, <laughs> all right? Uh, now I'm less uh, sure about that. In particular, I thought the United States used to behave in that kind of way. It was just because you changed administrations didn't mean that you could get to do whatever you damn well liked. No, uh, some things that you had to do. So now let me go back to Nobu's question. We'll wrap up. So where do the results come from? This is partly what Albert, I'll be done well before then. Um, so this is partly what this literature has done. So pretty much this entire literature considers, considers a restricted tax system with only capital labor taxes. This is what I was saying earlier. I think these, this, these systems are of academic interest. All right? I'm interested in them in my nerdy way. But let's not pretend that they have anything to do with practical policy advice, because the set of taxes available in practice is much broader than that. And so it's not, it's not a particularly interesting thing in applied work. It's an interesting thing in trying to think through the effects of models. With only capital labor taxes and the restriction that capital taxes must be less than 100%, you must impose an additional constraint, which is essentially a constraint that the capital tax cannot be exceed 100%. What that does is you now may want to tax capital income at a high rate. Why? Basically because what you want to do is to reduce the marginal utility of consumption in period zero as much as possible. Because that relaxes the implementability constraint. And by, by in order for you to reduce this marginal utility of consumption in period zero a lot, you got to reduce marginal utility of consumption. In the next period, you want this constraint to, be, to bind. You want to reduce this, you have this constraint has got to bind. So you can have that constraint bind for 10 periods or possibly infinity or maybe not, depending on the details of the particular problem. So that's at, at bottom. The reason in those kinds of models you want to tax capital income at a very high rate is to relax that implementability constraint. And one way of doing it is to promise to tax, high, uh, promise to tax capital income a lot that induces households to consume a lot today, that reduces their marginal utility today, relaxes the implementability constraint. It's as simple as that. It's nothing more complicated. So how do you do that when you have more instruments? So you when, I, when I have more instruments, when I, when, I, when I have, for example, a consumption tax, which is time varying, there's no natural restriction like this on that. 
There's no natural restriction that says that the intertemporal distortion must be capped by 100% or anything like that. You get the same marginal utility at time zero without having to have the intertemporal distortion. Exactly. And so that's, that's sort of a commentary on the, on the literature. Now let me go back to Nobu's question, which was, there's got to be a simple way of understanding all of these results. And I'll do the, the simple way of understanding it for the standard macro preferences, and then I'll comment briefly on how the general logic of, uh, works. So in order for me to make this point, all that stuff about global economy is not really that relevant, so just think about a closed economy with standard macro preferences and a standard capital accumulation technology. Okay? So this is the underlying economy, and then there are distorting taxes on consumption, labor, capital income, whatever you want to add yeah. is fine. Okay? That's the basic framework. Now, what I want you to do is to consider a completely different alternative economy. So what is this completely different alternative economy? In this completely different alternative economy, the representative household cares about a single object that I'll call C. I'll tell you what C, uppercase C, and a single object that I'll call N, and I'll tell you what those objects are. So they just care about final consumption good, final labor. Okay? What's the technology set? This is a constant terms to scale technology set. It consists of the final goods, the final single consumption good, the final single labor good, such that there exists a stream of intermediate goods. All right? Think of these now as intermediate goods, which get transformed into the final good. And these intermediate types of labor, if you will, get transformed into the final labor output. And of course, the resource constraint must be satisfied. These two economies are obviously equivalent. There's nothing different in these two economies. But in this economy, the allocation has got to be production efficient. In other words, you don't want to tax intermediate goods at all. You don't want to tax these individual CTs. So what do you want to do? You want to tax this final good at some rate, possibly labor at some other rate. But taxing the final good at, a, at, at some rate is equivalent to taxing each one of these consumption goods at a uniform rate. Okay? So if you want to know where the results come from, it's basically logic like this that leads you to the statement that uh, I've shown you, shown you this only for standard macro preferences, that this, this logic that you don't want to distort production efficiency, you want to have uniform taxes, is very general. Applies to a large set of environments, and so therefore um, you're going to, you don't want to distort intertemporal decisions. Let me stop right there. Yes. Let's assume that there is human capital. Then in, in, in order not to distort intertemporal location, then you cannot tax human capital. Then by taxing labor, are you taxing it and are you distorting intertemporal location? So the answer is that, so the so way you want to think about this is, think about the final goods that households care about. Okay, so let me make this point more generally. So what of, of this logic applies very generally even to Merleys like economies? Final consumption goods that households consume, primary labor inputs that households provide into production, and any primary inputs like land, uh, initial capital, stuff like that. Those three types of goods are the only goods that you ought to tax. And, and, uh, and, the, and uh, that statement is very general, that you don't want to distort production efficiency. We can talk later about 
particular circumstances where you may want to distort production efficiency. I'll talk about that in a minute. But, but basically, that, that's the stuff you want to tax. So even if you have human capital, if it takes some of your time to produce that human capital, it should be taxed based on the, on, on, on the value of your time. Not necessarily on the human capital income that you generate, but on the value of your time. It's the, your end, well, I mean, it's not really your endowment, because what I'm allowing you to tax here is the amount of labor you supply in the marketplace. All right, okay, so it's one minus, it's your endowment minus your leisure. That's the stuff that's being taxed, but you always want to tax those objects, and only those. You don't want to distort production efficiency. That's a general message that comes out of all of these analyses with unrestricted tax systems. When do you want to deviate from those kinds of principles? You want to deviate from those kinds of principles, I've already talked about one, in situations where there are other restrictions on your ability. There are other restrictions on your ability to um, make transfers across governments. I've talked about that. There's another su very subtle area where you may want to tax various forms of capital income. That's in environments which involve what I've called hidden trade, where people can make trades behind the planner's back, so to speak. And it turns out in those environments also, you may want to tax intermediate <clears throat> goods. Okay, but there's this general principle that if I can uh, if I can observe uh, final consumption, final, let's say, labor inputs, primary inputs, boom. That's the stuff I want to tax, okay? That's the, that's the principle that is very general. That's the principle that leads you to optimality of free trade and things like that. Right. More questions? All right. So thanks a lot for making this a great conference. I should 